the Sultanate of Oman lies on the eastern coast of the Arabian Peninsula. It's a relatively small country, about the size of Great Britain, and much of it consists of hot, dry, sandy desert. But this is only part of Oman's landscape, for beyond the desert plains and rolling dunes, there are limestone plateaus and high, cool mountains cloaked in lush woodland. On the open plains, rainfall is seasonal, and large shallow lakes form that quickly evaporate, leaving the fine clay soil cracked and parched for much of the year. Perennial streams cut their way through the mountains, but few will ever reach the sea. Like its landscape, Oman's wildlife is rich and varied. The Arabian oryx and gazelle were relentlessly hunted in less enlightened days. And almost the entire world population of tar is confined to the country's high, rocky slopes. Today, much of Oman's wildlife, whether large or small, find sanctuary within the country's many reserves and parks, established as part of the Sultan's commitment to nature conservation. The Arabian Peninsula forms a land bridge between the continents of Africa and Asia. It also lies on the flight path of many migrant birds as they travel between their breeding grounds and winter quarters. Just off the mainland, in the Gulf of Oman, lie a group of small rocky islands. And it's to these that a large number and variety of seabirds return each year. The shallow waters of the Gulf around the Damaniyat Islands are rich in small fish, especially in the spring. And it's then that large numbers of terns gather to breed. These are bridal terns. They spend most of their year scouring the warmer oceans for fish and small squid. They nest on the ground, usually under the cover of low vegetation or overhanging rocks. Courtship consists of the male parading around his potential mate with his head held low and his wings hung forward. Bridal turns are almost entirely black on top, while their underside is snow white. When flying low over the sea, coloured green with algae, they reflect the water's colour and appear green themselves. White-cheeked terns also breed on the Daminiat Islands. They're slightly smaller than the bridal terns and mostly grey on top rather than black. They prefer to nest in shallow scrapes in more exposed places, without the shelter of overhanging plants or rocks. Hemprix gull is a familiar sight throughout Oman's coastal waters. It's also known as the sooty gull because of its distinctive dark brown, almost black plumage. Many birds, like the wagtail and turnstone, stop off to feed here along the shore. They're on their way back to as far north as Siberia, having overwintered further south on the east coast of Africa. An osprey watches over them. It too is on its passage north, but presents no threat to the birds. It feeds entirely on fish. The noddy is an irregular visitor to these waters. It occasionally breeds here too, but only on the smallest of islands or even on sea stacks. The tern chicks are already well grown by the time the noddies settle down to breed in midsummer. To the southeast of Muscat, Oman's capital, the rocky shore is fringed by mangrove trees. The mangroves line creeks, bringing fresh water down to the sea during the rainy season. The trees grow in both brackish and salt water. 
the young mangroves are submerged and exposed by the tide, providing an ideal nursery for the young of many species of inshore fish. Above the water's surface, the larger mangroves, like any other tree, spread their leaves in the sun. This is a dwarf species of mangrove, really exceeding two meters in height. Where there are fish, fish-eating birds will not be far away. The Eurasian kingfisher, like many other birds here, is just passing through taking advantage of the rich source of food in the creeks. It breeds from the Mediterranean to Siberia. And although it lives mainly in freshwater, it's quite happy to fish for saltwater prey while it's on the way to and from its wintering grounds. Many wading birds also stop off here to pick over the rich mud in search of invertebrates. In fact, a whole variety of birds use the mangrove-lined creeks during the spring and autumn. The roller is a regular visitor. Its large size and conspicuous, brightly coloured plumage make it instantly recognisable. It normally feeds on insects that are taken on the ground, in the air, or occasionally from the water's surface. Insects are rare in this habitat. The mangrove's leaves are salty and virtually inedible. but there are plenty of crabs. Like the birds, they feed among the mangrove roots and mud exposed at low tide. Many are brightly coloured, especially the fiddler crabs. The males have one claw that's hugely enlarged and far too big to be of any use for feeding. That's left to its other normal-sized claw. The crab's eyes are held high on stalks, giving it good all-round vision to watch out for predators and other crabs. Fiddler crabs are very territorial and the males wave that enormous claw to warn off other males and attract female crabs to their patch. They can even feed and display at the same time. When threatened, they dive into the safety of their burrows and emerge moments later when the danger is past. On the more open mudflats lives another tiny species of crab. Dotilla is also highly territorial and displays with both arms to its neighbours. It feeds on organic detritus in the sand. The pellets are actually the rejected remains of a scoop of sand scraped from the surface using its front claws and then rolled and picked over in search of food. Mangrove ecosystems are among the most productive on Earth and crabs of all shapes and sizes feed on the mud and exposed roots. On the nearby beach at Kurum, ghost crabs follow the edge of the sea as the tide ebbs. These are shy crabs that never venture far from their burrows and rarely completely submerge themselves in water.
the loss of a claw is of no great importance to this one. It can still feed normally and a new limb will eventually grow in place of the old one. Nearby, it looks as if someone has been busy making sand castles. It's another type of ghost crab. While the tide is out, it's taking the opportunity to clear its burrow of loose sand. But instead of scattering the spoil over the beach, as most crabs do, it piles it up to form a small hillock. Exactly why it should do this is a mystery. It may help other crabs spot each other's territory more easily, or it could be that the crab uses its castle as a lookout post to watch for predators and rival crabs. Whatever the explanation, the crab's handiwork won't last for long. It will be flattened by the returning tide. The skies above the beach are the hunting ground of one of Oman's rarest resident birds of prey. The sooty falcon lives and breeds in isolated pockets of Arabia and neighboring North and East Africa. This one is nesting on the island of Fahal, just off the coast at Kurum. Its chicks are large and soon will be ready to fly. Until then, they will have to sit it out in the intense heat of their rocky crevice. It's late afternoon, the time of day when the male does most of his hunting, taking small migrant birds in mid-flight. They'll also venture inland in search of food. Oases, like the one at Mazaira, attract a whole host of wildlife. The date palms thrive here because there's permanent water fed by a small river or wadi. The pools provide water for both domestic and wild animals. Their warm, shallow waters are teeming with fish. Freshwater fish are rare in Arabia. Hardly surprising when you consider the climate and landscape. In fact, only nine species are known to exist on the whole of the Arabian Peninsula. Behind the oasis, the Jebel Akhtar, or Green Mountains, rise to a height of around 3,000 meters. Here, there's plenty of vegetation, tapping underground supplies of water. In common with much of this part of the world, annual rainfall here has been declining in recent years, and the trees have to send their roots deeper and deeper into the rocky soil. Among the rocks, there are small pockets of surface water, and like the oases, these act as magnets to the local wildlife. There are fish here, too, but the water is warm and poorly oxygenated. There's been no fresh supply coming into the pool for months. The fish have to gasp for air at the surface. There's other aquatic life, too. A huge water scorpion dwarfs a young toad. A swarm of hornets visits the pool regularly to drink. They're just a little too large for the toad to tackle. And it's probably learnt by now that the insects have a potent sting.
Butterflies take in water and salts from the surrounding mud. The water scorpion breathes through the long tube at the end of its body. It's not related to the true scorpions, but it is an active predator. A hornet is seized in the insect's front pair of legs. It will be dragged underwater to be drowned and eaten. Reptiles, like this large lacerted lizard, live around the waterhole, where there's an ample supply of both water and insects. This large, old male belongs to a species that's unique to this part of Arabia. His missing toes bear witness to the fact that the lizards are territorial and often fight each other to establish dominance. The females and younger males are speckled with pale green spots. Other lizards, like the agama, are common here too. They have a small, rounded, toad-shaped head and are quick to disappear at the first hint of danger. Overhead, an Egyptian vulture rises on updrafts of air formed as the wind hits the cliff face. The birds are resident here an indication that there must be a reasonable supply of animal carcasses to feed on. The Green Mountains are so named because of their plentiful plant life that's browsed by wild game and domestic stock. The steep terrain means there are plenty of accidental deaths, especially among young, inexperienced animals. This is one of the last strongholds of the Arabian gazelle. Like most of Arabia's large mammals, the gazelle has declined dramatically this century because of overhunting. Those that exist today do so mainly in captivity or within nature reserves like this one at Wadi Serin. An adult gazelle stands at about the same height as a medium-sized dog. Both male and female carry horns. In the females and young, the horns are quite small in an adult male, they can be very impressive and a useful aid to feeding. The gazelles share the rocky hills and plains with herds of domestic goats. The goats compete with the gazelle for food and in some areas can be a major problem. Goats browse on just about any edible plant within their reach. As well as leaves, they also eat new shoots and even branches, effectively stopping the tree from growing. They also devour any young seedlings, so there are no new trees coming up to replace the older dying ones. But the goats don't just stop at the branches they can reach from the ground. They're excellent climbers, and virtually every part of the tree is accessible to them one way or another. On the other hand, the goats belong to Bedou tribesmen, once traditional hunters of the Arabian gazelle and other game. They rely totally on their herds of goats and camels, and as long as they thrive, there's no pressure to hunt the wildlife. It's possible that it was here in Amman that the one-humped camel was first domesticated. The species no longer exists as a wild animal, 
and engravings of camels being used as beasts of burden have been dated to around 2800 BC. Like the goats, the camel is a browser, but doesn't have such a devastating effect on the local vegetation. High up in the Jebel Akhtar, among the sparsely vegetated crags and gullies, lives one of the world's rarest animals. The Arabian tar is about the size of a small goat, and it's now confined to a few remote localities in Amman. In the 1970s, the entire population was estimated at less than 2,000. It's well adapted to life in precipitous terrain. It has strong hooves and short muscular legs. Tara are normally found either singly or in small groups of either a male and female plus kid or just a female with her offspring. The tar has a prolonged breeding season and kids can be born at more or less any time of year. Like the adult, they are sure-footed almost from birth. And the kid stays close to its mother as she moves around the slopes in search of fruits, young shoots and grasses. To the south of the Jebel Akhtar, the terrain is deeply scarred forming high plateaus separated by deep gullies. One of the plateaus is home to another, even rarer mammal, and the scene of one of the most successful acts of conservation in the world. On the Jinnat Plains lives an animal that conservationists the world over think of when Oman is mentioned. The Arabian oryx was hunted to extinction in the wild as recently as 1972 a direct result of the availability of four-wheel drive vehicles and automatic weapons. Fortunately, some ten years earlier, a number of wild oryx had been caught for captive breeding projects as soon as their plight was becoming recognised. By the early 1980s, the captive population had already reached over 150 animals. Some were reintroduced into fenced areas in Oman. Later, the fences were removed and the animals were allowed to roam free. Since then, Operation Oryx has been a great success. The original group have bred successfully, and since their release, other groups have been set free on the Jidat al Harasis. The Arabian Oryx is one of the few large mammals that can exist in deserts with sparse vegetation and little water. By its successful reintroduction, Amman has replaced an important missing element in a fragile environment, and so reinforced the stability of the Sultan's sanctuary. <laughs>